Welcome everyone. We are so glad that you have joined us this evening. My name is Susan Kresnica and I am currently serving as the chair of the Sala Advisory Board. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank, uh, to introduce and thank my fellow Sala Advisory Board members, Jill Carmel, Janine Kay, and Courtney Spikes. I'd also like to thank other representatives from all of our Sala member schools, Archer, Buckley, Crossroads, Geffen, Marlboro, New Roads, Oakwood, Viewpoint, Windward, and our two new member schools, Briskin Elementary and Westside Neighborhood School. We are so glad to welcome you to the Sala community. If your school isn't part of Sala yet, we would love to have you join us. Please contact us through our website, salaspeakers.org, and we will let you know um, everything that's involved. Uh, before we jump into tonight's awesome conversation, I do have a few housekeeping announcements. First, this event is being recorded and the recording will be accessible through the SALA website early next week. We encourage you to share the recorded event with anyone at your school who couldn't attend this evening and we will send out a reminder through your school's SALA representatives when it is posted and available. Second, we will be um, having a Q&A session tonight. You can submit your questions throughout the event using the Q&A feature. And after the main presentation, we will answer as, we'll make sure we get to as many of them as we possibly can. Okay, on to the main event. We feel truly lucky to have Dr. Thomas Curran here with us tonight. I encountered Thomas's work earlier this year in a psychology blog that a colleague had sent to me, knowing that I was interested in the topic of perfectionism. And it was clear immediately that Thomas's perspective was innovative and quite nuanced. And I soon came to learn that Thomas is, to quote Adam Grant, the world's leading perfectionism researcher. He is an assistant professor in psychological and behavioral science at the London School of Economics, where he studies the rising tide of perfectionism, why it's happening, and what we can do about it. His 2019 TED Talk, which, in which he demonstrated these rising rates in perfectionism, has been viewed over three million times. His forthcoming book, The Perfection Trap, will be out in June 2023, and it is available now for pre-order on Amazon. And it is my great honor to welcome Thomas Curran to our Sala virtual stage. Thank you so much, uh, Susan, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And it really is a pleasure to be here this evening with uh, your wonderful organization. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who is on uh the call this evening um thank you for spending your thursday evening uh with me this evening as i'm going to delve into all things uh, perfectionism so what i'm going to do now uh is i'm going to share my screen and i have a slide deck that i'm going to go through for my talk and hopefully uh everybody can see that uh, if if not, I'm sure I'll get shouted at in a moment, but hopefully you can see that. Um, okay, so uh, as soon as my name is Dr. Thomas Curran, I'm an academic from the UK, and I'm really interested in perfectionism. Uh, and this is really a uh, just as much as a, a personal uh, curiosity, as much as it is an academic one. I myself am a perfectionist, uh, and as we work through um, today's presentation, I'm going to bring in some of my own experiences, as well as um, some research findings and, and theories from the, um, from the uh, psychological literature to kind of explain and expand on perfectionism a little bit more. And I'm in particular going to focus down busting a few myths, because one of the things about perfectionism is we kind of hold it up as uh, as a sort of celebrated quality, particularly in uh, modern culture and, and uh, modern society. Um, but as we work through today, I, I'm going to try, if I can, to try to convince you that actually this is something that we really should be um, aware of, uh, that's 
problematic and, and far from helping us is something that can hinder us quite um, substantially. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to focus particularly uh, from a parenting angle on both what we might be doing to contribute to perfectionism among young people, but also importantly, uh, what we can do uh, to alleviate some of the pressures that are associated with perfectionism. So this is what we're going to talk about today. And as I say, there's a Q&A at the end for any questions. All right, so I want to get started really with a very broad definition of perfectionism because I always try to introduce people to a topic uh, of perfectionism by giving you an, um, an overview of the two core components. So there's, so perfectionism is a personality characteristic. That's the first thing to say. Uh, and it's something that goes with us everywhere. So if you're a perfectionist, you tend to be perfectionistic in all domains uh, of life. And it contains two main components. The first is a striving for flawlessness and a need and a desire to be perfect in, in everything we do. Uh, but it comes in combination with um, highly critical and harsh self-evaluative tendencies. So it's this kind of idea that we have exceptionally high standards, but the baggage that comes with those standards is when we haven't um, met them, we tend to be very self-critical. Now, the researchers in the past have done a lot of work in this area from over many, many decades. And across clinical case reports, primary research studies going into the field, asking people about perfectionism, and also talking to young people and people who are afflicted by perfectionism, we've kind of come to an agreement in the academic literature that perfectionism isn't one thing, it's, it's many things. And we, we call this a multidimensional perspective on perfectionism. But essentially what we have is kind of this starting place of striving for flawlessness, overly critical self-evaluations, kind of two core components, but it can come from different places. So the first is self-oriented, it can come from within. And um, we see a lot of this. This is kind of what we think about when we think about perfectionism. The first thing that comes to our mind really is a kind of quintessential overstriver, exceptionally high standards, critical self-evaluations, very much directed inwards from the self. But it isn't just a self-process. Perfectionism also has a social element. So what we see when we talk to perfectionists is not just this kind of inner drive, but we also see a lot of these um, social perceptions about how the environment around us is excessively demanding. So not only do we do we see perfection directed from the self, but also we see perfection directed from outside too. There's this perception that other people expect me to be perfect. And when I'm not perfect, I'm judged harshly for it. And that's called socially prescribed perfection. And the third one is where, a uh, third dimension of perfection is where perfection is directed outwards onto others. So not only do we drive it from within, not only do we feel it from outside, but also we project it onto other people too. Uh, and so this is called other oriented perfectionism. So we expect other people to be perfect and we evaluate them harshly when they haven't met our perfect standards. So this broad um, uh, framework, I guess you would call it, of perfectionism is where we've pretty much landed after many, many years of discussion and debate on what the core components of perfectionism are itself, its social and its others. And we're going to carry this uh, broad definition for as we go as we go through. Um, the talk. So I said at the very beginning, I was going to bust some myths. We've described and defined perfectionism, and I've described its main features. So the first myth that I want to tackle is really the big one. And this is this idea that perfectionism is healthy, adaptive, um, and in some way positive. Now, we often think about this, and this is very much my experience too. So many, many years ago, uh, when I was working really hard to try to make my name in academia, uh, one of the things that I put myself under was intolerable pressure to be flawless, to, to achieve higher than average metrics all the time in uh, my assessments. So that would be my schoolwork and my university work. And the reason why I did this is because I was overcompensating for what I thought was deficit, this, this sense that I came from a, um, what we call in the, in the United Kingdom, a working class background. Um, and my main motivation was to try and lift myself above other people who I saw as uh, more superior, um, more resources, had uh, better access to um, <clears throat> uh, extracurricular activities and all the rest of it. 
And I kind of saw that I was always overcompensating for my, for my background. And one of the things I thought was helping me at that time was my perfectionism because I was ex ex striving excessively. I was shooting for really high standards and I was pushing myself uh, in the extreme. And while I was doing that, my mental health was deteriorating. My physical health was deteriorating. My relationships with other people were becoming compromised. And I truly believed because that's what society told me to believe. And that's how I, I felt like I should be behaving in this kind of winner takes all uh, highly competitive culture that actually perfectionism was the one thing that was holding me up whilst everything and all around me was collapsing. And that's what it felt like. Uh, that that it was integral for my success and that it was the one thing that kept me moving forward. And this perception really isn't just an individual perception that I hold. It's a perception that many people hold. And I, I teach young people and they and many, many young people hold exactly the same belief system. They believe that the, this exceptional level of exhausting and breathless striving is the thing that's keeping them going. And what I want to talk about in this particular section is how that is a myth. And not only is it a myth, it's an extremely dangerous myth because perfectionism isn't the thing that's holding us up in the world. It's the thing that's causing the problems in the first place. Let me explain. So we think about perfectionism, we think about high standards. We think perfectionists, they have excessively high standards um, and they're excessively high achievers because of those high standards. And we make this assumption quite understandably on the basis of what we see around us, right? We see people achieving really high uh, levels of, I don't know, academic achievement, sports achievement, uh, business achievement, whatever it might be. And we think, ah, they must have perfectionistic tendencies. They shoot for really high standards. Therefore, perfectionism must be what holds us up in the world, what, keep, what makes us successful. But we are confusing two things, I think, when we talk, when we speak like this, because high standards is one thing. Perfectionism is quite another. And we often confuse the two when actually they're very different. So this desire for high standards and need to place relentless demands on ourselves, okay? And the need for high standards, one is conscientiousness. One is this idea that we're meticulous, we drive for excellence, but we can let things go. And the other, this kind of relentless demand on the self, that's perfectionism. And that's really crucial, okay? This desire for high standards and the relentless demand that we place on ourselves is something we need to bear in mind when we're making distinctions between high standards and perfectionism because perfectionism is not about high standards at all. It's got nothing to do with standards. It's not a way of thinking. It's not shooting for something uh, that we think will be excellent or exceptional. Perfectionism at its root is deficit thinking so extreme that we live our entire lives in the shadow of shame. Shame about what we don't have, how we don't appear, and how we're not performing according to others. So it's a relational trait. It's a way that we view ourselves in relation to other people and how much less than we think we must appear to other people. So all these dimensions of perfectionism that I've talked about other-oriented, socially prescribed, self-oriented perfectionism, every single one at its root involves an attempt to repair what we believe is imperfect, to mend ourselves, to fix ourselves, because we believe we're inherently flawed. There's something imperfect about us that we must try to fix, or if we can't fix it, conceal from the world around us. That's a crucial distinction. Because if we can start there with our understanding of perfectionism, then we can begin to see it not as something that holds us up in the world, but something that ultimately is going to create uh, problems. And it creates problems through many different mechanisms. But the main one is it begins us on a, a negative spiral of self-defeat, uh, which can end in quite serious uh, mental health consequences. So let's put it this way. If the very basis of our being in life is to be approved of us to say that we feel imperfect and that we want to prove to other people that we're not imperfect, um, that we have uh, an amazing life, that we are attractive, we're cool, we're hip, we're trendy, we're productive, we're a high achiever. All of these things, this kind of need to be approved, approved of 
leads us to feel like we've got to excel because the only way we can guarantee approval is to excel. So it, we, we take on this belief system that uh, we must excel and we must excel at all times. So we set ourselves unrealistic goals and then we strive and struggle to meet those goals because they're unrealistic in the first place. And instead of recalibrating them downwards like we should do, instead we become critical and demanding. We set ourselves up for failure because we start to feel anxious and inadequate. We become less and less and less effective. And as a consequence, we overcompensate by setting even higher goals to compensate for the goals that we missed in the first place. And you begin to see this negative cycle of self-defeat start to kick in, whereby perfectionists are setting themselves up for the failure that is so devastating for the sense of self. And this is what we see in the research too. We see that perfectionists are really, really stress reactive. So what, what happens with perfectionism is um, it's fine until things go wrong. So what we have is this sense, okay, if things are going well, if, if we're succeeding or we're getting likes or shares or follows on social media, or we're getting A or A plus grades in our tests, there's an argument that suggests that perfectionism kind of rolls us along. It keeps us going. It's something that um, isn't necessarily too much of a problem. What, where it becomes a problem is when things start to go wrong. And as I said, perfectionists set themselves up for these problematic experiences because they set really high goals. So once we hit stress, we find the, 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 I guess, the real perfectionism comes out and we start to see problems. So perfectionists are highly stress reactive because they live their whole world trying to conceal what they think is flawed. So once they, that, those flaws are exposed, once we fail, once we hit setbacks, uh, once we have heartbreak or whatever it might be in our lives where, we, where stress comes in, we go in on ourselves we, we tell ourselves that how could you have been so stupid? Um, why didn't you do something differently? Uh, I told you that you weren't attractive or I told you that um, you weren't any good at presenting or whatever it might be that in that moment has, has caused stress. And as a consequence, those stressful events get magnified, they get amplified and they get protracted because perfectionists start to ruminate, they start to brood, they start to go in would and we see this i think anyway playing out in broader society right now we have a record levels of mental illness particularly uh, among young uh, people and uh, major depressive episodes and anxiety um diagnoses uh, are on the rise uh throughout covid we've seen mental health complications increase as we've moved uh, beyond the uh the pandemic uh, in, in inverted comments, uh, and young people are emerging now with uh, poorer mental health than when they went in. And what I want to what I want to do here is try to link these two these two things. Perfectionism at its root is a deficit thinking that creates significant mental health problems because of this dependency on other people's approval and this interaction with stress. That's to say, to hit a stressful event, perfectionists really struggle. It's a sort of anti resilience, so to speak. And we see, as a consequence of, of perfectionism's vulnerability to stress, extremely high correlations between perfectionism, particularly socially prescribed perfectionism, and things like depression, anxiety disorders, anorexia, OCD, and, and unfortunately, in, in um, some extreme cases, we, we do see uh, positive correlations between uh, thoughts of suicide too. So perfectionism has really strong correlations with some really negative mental health uh, outcomes. And one of the things our labs tried to do is to make the case that they these things could be linked. These uh, increases in mental uh, illness that we're seeing in broader society may be underpinned by perfectionism and growing levels of perfectionism among young people. And I'm going to come back to that. OK, so the first myth perfectionism is healthy. Um, Hopefully, having viewed perfection from a slightly different angle, we can begin to see how uh, that particular perspective on perfectionism doesn't hold up, especially when we look at relationships with mental health. Now, often what I'm told is when I report that data, well, OK, but we kind of know perfectionism is uh, problematic in terms of mental health. You know, it's kind of 
naked pursuit of success and um, in order to do that we need to make sacrifices and some of the sacrifices in, in, in our mental health but but tom what we get is performance right we get success and in a, in a culture and a society um where success is so crucial um particularly professional and academic success is so crucial to our uh, material security um you've got to put yourself through the ringer right you've got to be in some way perfectionistic in order to succeed today so there's this idea that if we don't endure the pain then we won't get uh, the gain well here's some data on the relationship between perfectionism and performance so this idea that perfectionism has anything to do with performance has been studied many many times and i want to just dwell on a couple of things so this is data in um academic contexts okay so schools and universities and basically what this study's done is it's aggregated all the studies that have looked at the relationship between perfectionism and performance first thing to say is socially prescribed perfectionism which is uh, similar to perfectionistic concerns has no relationship with performance whatsoever so if you have high levels of uh, socially prescribed perfectionism you're unlikely to see any performance benefit now there is a slight benefit to self-oriented perfectionism this is perfectionistic strivings okay but i would bear in mind that that's about that relationship there equates to about two to three percent of what we call variance explained that's tiny and when you think about the effort the perfectionist put in to get only 2% of a boost to your GTA or your performance scores at the end of it all seems like it's a bit of a short change. Um, so in academic context, there is a relationship <coughs> me, between perfection and performance, but it's really small. And when young people progress into the workplace, that relationship disappears completely. There is no relationship between perfectionism and performance. Now that's really curious because perfectionists do put in all this energy, they do put in all this effort and they do go above and beyond. And yet, whenever we crunch the numbers, we do not find relationships between perfectionism and performance. And when we do find them, they're really small. So what's going on here? This idea that we need perfectionism to succeed doesn't seem to be borne out in the data. We think there's two reasons. The first is perfectionism operates on a, uh, a curve. So that's to say there's a law of diminishing returns that are associated with perfectionism. So you have this kind of relationship between input and output. And what perfectionists do is they go above and beyond. So they move into the zone of increasing returns to the zone of decreasing returns, and then they go beyond it. So they put everything in and, and some and so what they're doing is they're sacrificing uh, things that they need to rest and uh, find rejuvenation. So things like sleep, uh, time with friends, good diet, exercise. All these things are, um, are sacrificed for the sort of naked pursuit of whatever it is that they're going after. And as a consequence, because they put in so much effort that they put too much effort, their performance takes a hit. This is the first perspective. But I think there's a more elegant perspective on why perfectionists don't tend to perform. And this is the perfectionism paradox. And what happens with perfectionism is something curious. Because you remember I said they struggle in stressful situations. Well, it's not just their mental health for this struggle. They also struggle with performance. Why? What happens is when perfectionists go for something, they go for it with all their might. So when we put people in the lab and we say, go for a goal, okay, and work as hard as you can to meet that goal, perfectionists will put everything forward on the first attempt. So we do, we do this sometimes in the lab. We give them like a cycling task and we say, you should be able to complete X amount of distance in X amount of time, go. But they'll put so much effort forward. However, if we manipulate some feedback at the end of that performance and say, actually, you failed, no matter how well you did, which is going to tell you you failed because you really want to see how you react. We're not interested in the performance. So we tell people they fail, no matter how they performed, and then we say, do it again. Something really interesting happens. If you're high on perfectionism, your performance on the second trial falls off a cliff. If you're not a perfectionist, your performance doesn't change. Why? Because you can't fail at something that you didn't try at. And this is the perfectionism success paradox in action. Because what perfectionists do is they put effort in, no doubt about it, 
But if they come into problems, if they meet challenge, if they truly believe that they can put all of their effort forward and they still might not succeed, well, the shame and the guilt and the embarrassment that they feel because they failed is so visceral, is so strong that they don't want to put themselves through that again. So they withhold, they avoid. And this is why you see procrastination, for instance, being so strongly correlated with perfectionism. It's avoidance. It's anxiety management. This is a difficult thing. I'm not sure I can do it, so I'm going to distract. Okay? You you also see them engage in um, just complete withdrawal of behavior sometimes. They hold themselves back uh, in evaluative condition, uh, uh, um, evaluative uh, situations like interviews or pre job presentations or whatever it might be because they think they might be judged harshly. So it can hold you back in professional settings. It can hold you back in school settings. I see this among young people all the time uh, at, at university. There's this sense that it, the failure is such a huge um weight that i can't possibly bring myself to uh, open even my grade book i mean i've had students come in and i've said how, how you know did you did you feel like you you did well in that test did you uh, was the grade okay and they said I haven't even looked at it i can't bring myself to open it because they're so concerned that a low grade uh, will create a sense of self-castigation and self-criticism so strong that they just don't want to do it so this for me is the key reason why this idea that we think perfectionism is necessary for success needs rethinking because perfectionism isn't something that holds us up it isn't something that's going to push us forward to success particularly when things get tough we tend to find perfectionists withdraw and they withdraw because of uh, the shame and guilt that's associated with failure. So that's the second myth I really wanted to cover because I think it's so important, particularly for young people. I see this a lot. I see this so much, this withdrawal behavior, this procrastination behavior, this, this just avoid at all costs behavior. And listen, I'm a perfectionist. I do this too. My book has taken three years to write. That's two years over uh, deadline. And the reason is because I just cannot let it go because I cannot bear to feel like there's more I could have done or there's, the book could be more perfect in X, Y, and Z ways. So for me, this is such an important thing to bear in mind when we talk about perfectionism and, and why it holds us back more than it pushes us forward. Finally, I want to take you back to the med, med, epidemics of mental Ill health among young people because one of the things that we typically talk about these days, I've seen it talked about a lot, is that you know, young people these days are, are more fragile, um, that they, they're, they're given to more accommodations and therefore that's why they suffer from these mental health um, issues. Susan mentioned at the very beginning that my work looks at perfectionism across time and rising perfectionism. And I don't think this particular viewpoint on young people uh, matches with the data and what we're seeing. Because what we're seeing in the data, when we look at perfectionism over time, when we track college students over time, and we ask them um, at different birth cohorts, we ask them the same question about their levels of perfection. What we're seeing, particularly for socially prescribed perfectionism, I draw your attention to the, uh, to the graph on the right here, is an exponential rise in socially prescribed perfectionism. The perception other people expect me to be perfect. This is exploding. This doesn't strike me as a generation that feel like they're having it easy or they're being accommodated. This is a gen. This looks to me, this data, like a generation that feel these pressures put being put on them are becoming more and more unbearable, and that almost socially prescribed affection is going to cry for help underneath a huge weight of pressure that they feel. And why do they feel that pressure? Well meritocracy. We live in a competitive society. And particularly in America, there's a dominant cultural view that um, we are a, a bunch of freedom loving individuals, and anyone can be the next Jeff Bezos, as long as they work hard enough. This is core to the meritocratic principle. And it's become even more core to the way we live in, in the West since uh, our economy took a uh, turn around the late 70s uh, to a free market 
uh, economics and a sense that essentially uh, it's every man and woman for themselves. You work hard, you get the rewards. You don't, you fall behind. Meritocracy is core to this belief. Now, way back in the 50s, uh, a little known philosopher called Michael Young, a British politician, wrote a, a dystopian essay. Uh, because back then, the uh, society was moving towards um, this kind of idea of meritocracy. But of course, it was still a social democracy. Uh, there were still strong unions. Uh, government had a big role in people's lives. It was a very different society. And Michael Young said many, uh, many things in his dystopian essay, but it was a warning, really, about meritocracy, about where it could lead if it was left to its own devices. And he, he, he wrote uh, about essentially a two-tiered system where you had the, the, the best and the brightest on the top. So the eminent, they know their success is the reward for their own efforts. And then the lower orders at the bottom who have nobody else to blame but themselves because they didn't work hard enough, they weren't bright enough, or they just simply were lazy and didn't want to put the effort in. Now, who can really argue with this is uh, something that uh, I think on the surface anyway, is a fair reflection of meritocracy, right? So the best and the hardest work and goes as the spoils. It's difficult to argue with that, right? However, one of the things that we're beginning to see nowadays is huge levels of inequality, just like uh, Michael Young foresaw. But meritocracy sanitizes these gaps between rich and poor by clothing them in moral fabric. It is, they essentially says, this is fine. This level of inequality, this kind of rock, this kind of huge uh, disparity between the top and everyone else is totally justified because those at the top deserve it and those at the bottom haven't worked hard enough. They simply don't, uh, they, they haven't warranted uh, their, uh, you know, their, their place and their share in society. And that's why uh, they don't have the money, the assets, whatever it might be. So basically, meritocracy these days anyway, is um, very much a way to uh, clothe inequality um, in moral fabric. Now, how does that look then on, a, on the ground? And particularly in schools and colleges where I want to focus this talk. What's meritocracy's impact been on those institutions? Well, first of all, it's undoubted that, that it's created a hell of a lot of pressure. So in a meritocracy, of course, you work hard, you amass a set of degrees, certificates, accreditations, and then you sell them in the job market for the highest possible price, right? This is just how it works, okay? And, and essentially, in this regime, under this meritocracy, the place that I work, uh, college, university, but also schools, are just cogs, really, in that credentializing machine, okay? We rubber stamp young people and say, yep, you have the credentials to go into the workplace and demand a higher salary, okay? Because that's what it's all about, okay? We're, we're essentially uh, ranking, sifting, sorting, nonstop competition to segregate young people based on their abilities and how hard they can work. That's just how things work in the meritocracy and we do this all the time. And that creates intense stress intense anxiety, all the while, by the way, social mobility in the US, the UK, across the West is collapsing, adding to a sense among young people, there's almost this existential pressure to achieve at school and college, because if I don't, look what's gonna happen, okay, I'm, I'm gonna move backwards, okay? So I'm gonna have to work relentlessly just to hold on to the standard of living that my parents had, let alone go further. So there's this sense, that we know things and we know mobility is moving backwards. There's intense competition. The uh, college competition at the moment is so hot. It's so tough to get in. And young people see this. They're not uh, blind to it. They feel it. And they've been, uh, they've been brought into this system to believe that that's just, just the way it is, right? It's natural. It's normal. It's how things work. And unless you're exceptional, you're going to fall behind, right? They're going back to this Michael Young uh, 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 argument, you know, you're gonna fall behind with the dunces if you don't work. 
And not only does that have a massive impact on young people, and they feel it. I mean, I see these young people come through. They're the best of the best at our institution. But they come so tightly wound with tension because they've worked unbelievably hard just to get there. So young people feel this, but parents too feel it. Of course they do. How can parents not feel this? Because it's everywhere right now. And on top of their own duty to succeed in a meritocracy, they also take on the successes and failures of their children. And I want to emphasize this because I think it's really important. There is no alternative right now. Parents have to be so aware about their children's futures because it matters. It matters. If they don't do well in school, in this day and age, in this economy, there are going to be problems long term. So parents feel it. They know it. They can see it. It's visceral. And so therefore, they transmit that pressure to young people by uh, providing lots of structure, uh, a focus and energy and attention on school. So school is really, really important. There's a lot of parenting data, a lot of parenting trends to see how American parents are shifting their time from leisure to academic activities. And it's occurring really quickly and then really fast. And, and, it, and there's a tendency amid all of this to point at parents and say, why you put so much pressure? And I really have been so keen in any of the work that I've done in this area to emphasize that there is no blame here. There is no fault on parents because what other option do you have? You do not have any, any other options in this culture and in this economy. You, you ha- your kids have to do well in school because the alternatives don't bear thinking. So when school pressures are rising like they are, when college acceptance rates are plunging just like they are, And certainly not when we've got these gaping inequalities right now that mean that more and more young people are falling behind. The middle class is becoming hollowed out almost daily. Amid all of that pressure, amid all of that um, worry and concern and anxiety, we we see um, parents respond quite naturally uh, with higher levels of expectation, higher focus on school, et cetera, et cetera. And this is where this uh, phenomenon of helicopter parents has come about. And typified, I think, really nice, uh, uh, not nicely, but really um, illustratively in the uh, college admissions scandal, uh, which I'm sure everybody's aware of. Um, Essentially, um, some very wealthy parents um, cut some corners with the help of uh, 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 Rick Singer uh, to get their kids backdoor entry into elite college places. Now they didn't have to do this. These these parents are already rich and they've already got enough money to, uh, for their kids to live multiple lifetimes in, 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 uh, in, in advantage. And yet, and yet they turn to criminality just to get a place at an elite college spot. I don't think there's a more illustrative example of how meritocracy has taken such a hugely devastating turn in the way that Um, we view success in society than this scandal because it really does show how much pressure there is on parents for their for their children to succeed and get into the top universities so parents see this and they respond and 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 again quite understandably no blame at all Uh, if you're a parent uh, any 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 parent right now would do exactly the same. This is the way that you show your children that you love them because you know it's so important. So by expecting high achievement, by reminding them also the consequences of not achieving, uh, we you know we've labelled the these the parents helicopter parents in uh, in in a way to describe how they hover, how they provide high levels of structure and expectation, um, and how they keep children on their tiptoes. Right, the kind of strain this idea that straining on their tiptoes, fearing the consequence of failure, and, and, and creating an inadvertent but nonetheless um, problematic dependency on this kind of elusive approval, this elusive sense that there's always something more, there's always another achievement, there's always another A grade to get just around the corner. And we know this is happening because we've done some research recently to show um, that essentially when we ask young people over time, um, these are college student data, um, 
how high were your parental expectations? So did your parents set really in, uh, high and excessive standards for you? And what we see is, is, is a really strong positive correlation between time and parental expectations. What does that mean? It means parental expectations are rising quite rapidly over time. And actually, the, the, the rise is really stark. Um, the average young person today would score at the 70th percentile of expectation scores in 1989. That's a huge, huge increase, almost 40 percent. And when you look at the relationship between expectations and socially prescribed perfectionism, it's really strong. That, trust me, that's a big relationship. So put these two things together. And what we've argued in our paper is that high and rising levels of parental expectations are feeding perfectionism epidemic that we're seeing. So one of the things that's really important um, particularly for someone uh, who's a researcher in this area, is to recognize that this is going on, to say, look, these expectations seem to be rising. Young people are telling us that they feel more pressure uh, from their parents, and those expectations are strongly linked to socially prescribed perfections, which, remember, is the form of perfectionism that has some quite strong relationships with uh, negative uh, mental health outcomes. That, that societally, this is something that we need to be recognize, uh, and this is something that, that as a collective, that together we need to try to wrestle with, because I don't think we, we were able to un, um, unpack this at an individual level, given that the pressures on, on young people and parents are so strong that there really is no other option but to set high expectations. So what we need to do is have a conversation as a society as to how much pressure is too much pressure. Because I have no doubt that parents do not want to set these high expectations. I have no doubt it's against their better instincts. But I do believe that they feel little choice. Okay, so how does this look for young people on the ground? Well, we're starting to see some worrying signs that we might be at a breaking point, particularly among advantaged youth. And this is quite important because we often talk about um, disadvantaged youth quite rightly. Um, I come from a disadvantaged uh, community myself and I know what it's like to grow up around and in poverty so um, these are things that we must you know uh, attend to absolutely but what we're also seeing now is a lot of issues around um, advantaged teens higher rates of drug and alcohol use and less advantaged contemporaries and they suffer rates of mental illness up to triple those of match peers which is really concerning about 75 percent of high school students around half of middle school students say they feel stressed always stressed by schoolwork so thirds said they're always worried about getting into their preferred college. Uh, 55% uh, and 62% of, uh, of elementary, so 55 of elementary and 62 of high schoolers said they need to be perfect in their schoolwork. That's a hell of a lot. And perfect is a hugely ambitious goal. Uh, UCL have put out a recent survey that basically says uh, students are feeling incredibly overwhelmed. This soared by more than 60% of the sense that they're overwhelmed since the mid 80s and the American College of Health Association, uh, again, finds overwhelming anxiety up um, from 50% to 62% five years later recently. So these are really worrying uh, statistics, particularly around mental health issues in college students and more affluent youth, um, and around a sense of being overwhelmed, that overwhelming anxiety that's being placed on. And by the way, this is not just this is not just parent overs, this is just broadly. These are pressures out there in the world uh, that are becoming uh, an incredible burden for young people. So here's where I wanted to finish this section because I think it's really important. When Michael Young wrote that dystopian um, essay about how meritocracy would create this two-tier society, it was very much premised on the idea that it would cause misery for those who got left behind, that it would immiserate a underclass. What he didn't foresee, but what's actually happening right now is that not only would meritocracy create doubt, misery and despair for those who didn't make it, but it would also create those same feelings for those who did make it too. And so I think it's an incumbent upon us all as a society to recognize that the pressures meritocracy is building in to our schools, to our colleges, to our workplaces, are breaking young people under the unbearable weight of perfectionism. And that at some point, we're going to ask how much pressure is too much pressure. Okay. All right. I finished that on a very um, uh, bleak note on a societal note, but I do think it's important. 
and I want to move to some some hope. I want to move to something positive now. But I do think uh, we're only going to uh, turn the curve on this, or turn the corner on this, I should say, if collectively we uh, have the, the conversation as a society about what's happening right now in our uh, in our academic institutions. Okay, so what what can I do? I think it's really important as parents. What can we do? Because if we see uh, uh, our um, our uh, our children struggling with perfectionism. I wanted to provide uh, some useful tips and hints. And I think the main thing, and this is the overriding feedback really is talk, openness, have conversations, create a sense of psychological safety in the family to just openly talk about uh, concerns that we might have around pressures and expectations and, uh, and how we feel when we don't quite meet those high standards that we expect of ourselves and that we feel other people expect of us. So the first thing is, to say that perfectionists worry a lot about how they appear to other people. I've talked a lot about academic uh, pressures, I haven't even touched on social media and all that sort of stuff today. But of course, as parents, you will be well aware that these are also impossible pressures inside those platforms. And you tend to find this uh, among uh, young people that they worry about how they're perceived by other people. So it's really important to create an atmosphere where we can talk about those worries allow kids to show themselves and, and show their authentic selves and how they feel. Um, and if there are issues and concerns that they can bring them and that we can have a conversation. So encourage them to get curious, ask questions about those worries. Why do you feel like that? And, and is a sense and a worry about how you're appearing to other people really worth living in fear for? These are really important conversations I think is important to have with young people. And I try to have them with uh, my students all the time when they worry about how they're performing relative to other people because that's really interesting at elite universities what you tend to see is even objectively high levels of achievement can feel decidedly disappointing because everyone else is so so good so it's important to break down those uh, beliefs and challenge them uh, young people who professionally also focus on their flaws their deficiencies they feel imperfect so when they seem preoccupied with those negative thoughts and feelings, particularly around a setback, if they haven't done well at school, a particular grade has been poor or whatever it might be, to do encourage them to reflect on that. Don't dismiss them, that's important. Acknowledge the emotions, get them to label them and, and, and importantly, find compassionate ways to move forward. So I often find sometimes a really good ex uh, exercise for myself because I have these feelings myself is to grab just a pad and write, write down how I feel like when I've done something wrong or when I feel like I haven't performed in a presentation or what it might be um, <clears throat> and really try to focus instead on, on actually like how far I've come right so what's going well how, how, how much have I achieved and, and just to try and list off you know really how far you can come because you can get lost in those little moments of setback from the bigger picture so I, I find it's a good um, idea on my computer or wherever to just grab a pad and make a list of achievements and every time, you know, you make a new achievement, add it to the list. And then when you hit a setback, you can always refer back to this. To say, this is how far I've come. And actually, you know, this is just one little stumbling block. It's one roadblock on a, on a broader uh, journey of development and growth. Irrational thinking, you'll also, you'll also see a lot too. Um, this kind of rigid must, have to, should work harder. You see this a lot. Again, it's really important. Don't uh, repress those thoughts if you see them um kids can yeah, you find it's really important particularly among young people to say them out loud write them down because breaking down irrational thoughts are so so important okay so this you feel this okay you feel you've got to get an a plus and you can't have anything but an a plus all right let's write that down now how strongly do you actually believe that and let's ask another follow-up question. What if? So what? What happens if you don't? What are the consequences? And you can break down those consequences and start to bring young people around to the conclusion that they're not as dire as what they believe. And again, it's all about talking. It's all about bringing young people to um, a more grounded uh, sense that, you know, life is a journey. It's about exploration. It's about growth and development. And if we make mistakes, we hit setbacks, it's not the end of the world. We, we can always go again. Putting things off again, I talked about procrastination. This is so important when it comes to perfectionism. But again, you will see this a lot among young people who are highly perfectionistic. So I often find with young people when we're talking to them about getting started, avoiding things, I apply this to myself too. You've done this before. You know how to do it. 
getting started is going to feel so much better. So let's get something on, on paper. We can always edit. We can always do something with it when it's finished. But if we haven't got it done, if we haven't started it, then we can't possibly make any improvements because there's nothing there for us to work with. So try not to overthink it. Again, I, I often put um, post-it notes in my office um, around, you know, getting started is better than uh uh, so starting is, is better than not starting at all. Good enough is good enough. Um, all of these kind of things that kind of remind me that it might feel tough to start a big project, but actually once you've started, things become easier um, and just try not to overthink it. Just get in there and dive in and go for it. And also time away is super important too for young people and for yourselves. Preemptive self-care really starts with yourself. Um, but it's also applied to young people too. So replenishing those mental and emotional reserves before the burnout hits is really important. Don't double down once you're in a, you're in a place of burnout. So give yourself a break, make time for leisure activities. We're seeing a lot of displacement of uh, parenting from leisure to academics. And I'm wondering whether we just need to move that dial a little bit back in the other direction, go to the park, go to the cinema, go shopping, whatever it might be, give it time off, time away, um, and allow uh, yourselves to recharge. Um, is super, super important. And ultimately, uh, just to finish, uh, for, for me, the three biggest corrective to perfectionism is parents to bear in mind are openness, being open, being warm, and providing unconditional regard. Okay, this is a sense that basically there's no conditionality to our approval and our love. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean there can't be consequences when, you know, children are misbehaved, but that our love is unconditional. So just go ahead and tell kids, even tonight, that you know they don't need to justify themselves to anyone or anything in the world. They're worthy of love and affection, and they matter. They matter in this world simply because they exist. And that's such an important message because perfectionists really struggle with a sense of self-esteem, the sense that they matter. And reminding them of that is super, super important. And again, Really, what this boils down to for me, we can do all of these things in our personal lives and we should, but that will not take away the fact that we live in a world that is creating these pressures by design. Okay. And the reason advertising is there to make us feel insecure, and the reason schools, colleges, and parents have to push young people is the same reason when we're at work, we feel so on edge and insecure because we live in an economy that has to grow far more than we need to be content and it's the bottom line and if we can try together to build something more sustainable something where pressures don't need to be unbearable for us to thrive i think it's really important and i just want to finish kate rayworth an economist at oxford has a great perspective on a sustainable economy she calls it the donor economy and i really believe that's not going to be essential for you know for, for uh, the planet but it's also going to be essential for us humans too. If we can find us a, a zone of sustainability that we can we can live in. So for me, that's that's the most important. All right, I'll leave these tips up, but I just wanted to finish there. I hope you found it really, really um, informative and I am available for questions um, now. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, I've got to plug my book as well, of course. My book is out soon, but I think we're going to put that at the end. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was wonderful. Um, and we've already had quite a few questions that I am hoping you can uh, uh, address. I think I'll start with the one that I feel is broadest and it has to do with how we can recognize perfectionism in our kids. How do we know that that's what's going on and find that distinction between setting high standards, which can be productive and healthy, um, and and conscientious, I believe was your word, um, and and something that is more uh, that is much more harmful. This more this true perfectionistic, uh, you know, kind of paradigm that's seeded by a sense of deep unworthiness or um, being flawed. How do you see it? How does it appear and how can parents recognize it? The main, the biggest one is um, uh, rumination brooding and not being able to let things go. I think it's important. And really, it's you see it when things start to go wrong. 
so um perf- you know that doesn't when i say perfection it doesn't isn't linked to performance doesn't mean you don't have perfectionistic young people who are high performance uh, and actually the, they, there tends to be uh, a relationship um particularly in the short term and when <clears throat> uh, young people are entering into the world but once things start to go wrong that's when you start to see the difference if you're conscientious you are able to let things go. You uh, respond very adaptively to that failure. Okay, fine, no problem. You know, you might be disappointed. That's fine. I mean, we're all disappointed when we haven't succeeded. But there isn't a sense that we are holding on to that failure as something more than just what it is, just a failure. And we, we were able to adapt. We're able to move on to the next thing, and that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll do, you know, we'll, we'll, next one, next time, it will be better. Perfectionists don't respond like that. They tend to hold on. They don't let things go. You tend to see a lot of brooding, rumination, worry about how other people are going to perceive that. How are other people going to think? Overthinking. Oh, does it mean my teacher maybe um, doesn't doesn't like me? Or or is is there you know uh, is is there something about uh, my calculus that I just don't understand and I can never get my head around and and that you you know that there's something underlying about me that's created the the bad grade right once you start to see that kind of that uh sense of overgeneralization of the failure to the self that's when perfectionism is, is 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 likely to to be at play and that's when it's important to try to intervene with some of the things that I mentioned Mm-hmm. Do you know, is there a particular uh, kind of developmental stage or age when you're most likely to see the the very first inklings of that? Or is, is it really, does this happen, you know, across at, at various times for different people? Is there any pattern regarding its onset? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question and there's not enough evidence on it. What I would say is that uh, we know that there's a her- heritable component to perfectionism. So about 30 to 40 percent is herited. So what you see before any of these social factors come in in elementary school, you will begin to see these kind of traits bubble up if, if it's in you. And certainly it was in me. Um, and and so that, you know, you know, and that's really, you know, social the culture hasn't had a chance really to take hold at this point. But it is important if you are recognizing those early signs to be very aware of that, because culture is only going to amplify that. It's only going to exacerbate those tendencies. So we're going to have to work really hard to try to shield and um, provide uh, um, help and support in ways of managing setbacks because it's likely that those uh, young people will, will struggle so there's no real hard and fast um time but but as i say because of that heritable component you you can see it among um, some quite young children yes i think that's really helpful to be aware of um, and it relates to another question that came in in a couple of different articulations the and it has to do with parents themselves who are they feel their own perfectionism, especially for instance, we had um, one question about a parent feeling very, uh, quite a bit of anxiety and pressure regarding the college application process that uh, that they're watching their child go through. And so they're looking at their own kind of impulse to perfectionism in this arena alongside their child and even noticing that their child is aware of their experience as a parent. Can you speak a little bit about when you when you see it in yourself and you know that it's 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 becoming part of a uh, the part of the problem in, in your relationship with your child, what you can do as a parent for yourself and for their for the for your own sake and for theirs, I suppose. Oh, absolutely. I mean it, it becomes an echo chamber. Um and I think that as a parent, it's really important being uh in 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 the position of responsibility i guess or position of authority i suppose to 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 be the one to step in and recognize that actually not only for the not only for your children but also for yourself actually that you know it's it that you what professionals try to do is constantly try to happen in the world rather than let the world happen to them. Because it's really hard. Like we feel like we can we can move mountains. We feel like we can change the course of destiny when actually sometimes fate has, has its role and fate is indifferent to our feelings. And sometimes for no good reason, we don't make the college cut, even despite all of our efforts. The problem with perfectionism 
is it makes Shane stick to Fate's Crossfire, I suppose, like, I don't, you know, so strongly. And I think as parents, it's important to recognize that. Really important to recognize that it's hard. Trust me, I couldn't submit my book for three years. So letting things go is tough. And this is the expert on perfectionism talking today. I uh, don't pretend it's easy, but I do think it's essential for us to recognize that life is going to happen. And sometimes for no good reason, things don't go the way we planned. And to be able to just sit with that feeling and and and, and then live with the anxiety that it's going to engender, at least for a little while, because your kids will see it. Because they'll know something's gone wrong. Then, you know, they're aware of these things. But if their parents are able to let that sink through them as a, as a kind of humanizing reminder, I guess, of what it means to be in this world as a human being, then that's a really important lesson. And that's a lesson you can teach without saying a word. So for me, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, we had quite a few questions about the relationship between perfectionism and various mental health conditions. Um, so if you could speak a little bit more about that and specifically if there are any um, if there are any specific mental health conditions that are more highly correlated with perfectionism and why, I think that would be helpful. People raise, there are, there are truly like a laundry list of different conditions in the Q&A. So I think if you could maybe um, go into that a bit for different specific mental health conditions, that would be helpful. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, in the literature, we call, um, academic literature, we call perfectionism a transdiagnostic risk factor. And what that means is that perfectionism contributes to a whole litany of mental health complications. Why? Because of this built-in, and it's a really aggressive built-in, vulnerability to setbacks and moments of stress. You know, perfectionism keeps us up, it holds us up until it doesn't. And then things start to cascade. So we feel low mood, we get anxious, we brood, we ruminate, we start to worry about our body and how we appear to others. So there is these self-presentational concerns that start to kick in. If you were to ask me what are the most strongly correlated, I would say certainly presentational concerns. So anything uh, that's related to how we look and how we appear to other people, we see strong relationship with body image concerns, um, but a very low body appreciation, low levels of self-esteem, chronically low self levels of self-esteem among socially prescribed patients. So those things are, you know, they tend to be really, really strongly correlated. But that doesn't mean to say that we don't see also a strong correlation with depression, anxiety, um, things like OCD, because, as I say, it's not just one particular mental health complication we start to see, it's many. Certainly, this is my experience. Uh, my um, uh, I, I had some, you know, crazy amounts of anxiety, but they also are laced with depression, worries and presentational concerns about how I appeared to other people. There were all sorts of things going on when I really struggled with perfectionism because of this sense that, you know, when things go wrong, when I've hit like, you know, have a heartbreak, something happens in, in my life that I had no control over again, this idea about fate, that, that, that suddenly I'm exposed and everybody can see um, what I always knew, but I was trying to hide. And, and as I say, that creates all sorts of manner of um, mental health complications. But I guess in answer to your question, it's those presentational ones that are the most uh, profound. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, interesting, though, to know that actually it's what was the name of that term? It's a trans uh... Uh, trans diagnostic risk factor. So it just means that it's it uh, like a lot of personality characteristics only have one or two things that they uh, correlate to with perfectionism. Just if you you throw it out there, it will be correlated with it. it yeah. it's, it's crazy. Mm hmm. Um... And I think especially for all, I mean, I know so many of us uh, are watching this happen to our own <clears> children and our, our, our children and our you know, friends' children. I think it's all the more important to understand that this is, it's not just going to be one that this is, this is a force that could actually uh, exacerbate any of these, many of these potential conditions. We had a, a question about any differences in the perception or experience of perfectionism um, within minority groups. Do you know, is, uh, is there any data, is there anything you could share with us about differences or a lack thereof when you look at those types of um, societal breaks? 
That is a really good question. Such a good question. The answer is we don't have the data, but what I can tell you is from experiences that uh, and talking to other people and, and trying to like figure out why it is that you tend to see uh, minority groups have particular struggles with this, particularly if they make it. This is the thing. What's really interesting is what, when you have economic and social forces working against you around the clock, like, like minority groups do and people from poor backgrounds more generally, if you suddenly elevate, have, find yourself elevated into um, the uh, academic meritocratic sorting machine, you are going to be really, really find it really tough because not only do you have to overcome those crushing expectations and pressures that we talked about, that everybody else has to undergo but you also have to overcome other obstacles too uh, like stereotype threats discrimination um and a sense that you know like i described in my own experience that you've got to really work so much harder just to stay at the same pace so we see a lot of perfectionism among these groups and and i uh, think it's because of that uh, but we don't have any data and it's something that I'd like to do a bit more work on. There's a section in my book about it because I feel very strongly that there's, 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 there's an, you cannot understand this without also understanding um, uh, social factors. Yeah, I can imagine, um, especially with your own experience. Um, we've had several questions that, that I think um, the, your slide uh, that one of your last slides was attempting to address, but I think, the, the way it's being articulated is, well, if it isn't meritocracy, what is it? Like, if this is an unhealthy cultural context, then what, what, do we, what do we do about it? What do we replace it with? What's our alternative? First of all, to say that this isn't a meritocracy. What we, what we, what we have, a, merit, you know, a meritocracy would, would be where every person has an equal opportunity to ascend or be whatever they want to be. Well, it's not what we have. We have a, we sort of have a Darwinian style hunger games for the affluent and a sort of American dream Trojan horse rolling in behind for everyone else, right? The kind of clothes and inequality in its moral fabric. That's not meritocracy. A true meritocracy would give opportunity for everyone. And that wouldn't be opportunity to be well-educated. That would be opportunity to pursue um, a, a path in life that's of our own choosing and for our contribution to society to be recognized, no matter what it is. That's a true meritocracy. And there's no reason why we can't try to put in place as a society um, policies and um, and redistributive frameworks to, to make that happen, you know, to fund education properly, um, to bring down uh, inequality. You know, they do this in, in the Scandinavian countries uh, with very little uh, problem. Now, it's not perfect, and no is perfect, and don't get me wrong, you know, there are, there are you know, I'm not, I'm not drinking from uh, the cup, but what I would say is that, you know, we can often face these problems as think it's too much. Like there's no alternative, there's nothing we can do. I would say there's plenty we can do if we just confront the reality that what we have right now is not a meritocracy. It's a, it's a very strange quasi faux meritocracy. And actually if we redesign, if we, if, we just, if we just had a different set of rules, a different set of criteria about what we think a fair and equitable society would look like, and, and how that society would provide everybody, no matter where they come from, an equal opportunity to pursue their own path in life. This is not to say be rich. That's some people don't want to be rich, but that's just to say that they have a they have the freedom, the real freedom, to pursue those interests. So uh, for me, it can be done. It just it's just a matter of will and imagination. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, there are there's uh, uh, several people have asked if you could dig a little bit deeper into the way perfectionism and social media relate to one another. I know you kind of tapped on that uh, in one of your slides, but if you could talk about it a little bit more, I think it would be helpful. I mean, that is a whole another presentation, but thank you. I, I'll be trying to be brief because um, this is a, such a huge, such a huge um, part of the problem. 
Uh, I think at base, at base, you've got to recognize that social media platforms are just advertising devices. That's the first thing to bear in mind when we look addressing this and what, what the advertisers do. They um, punch holes in our existence so that we try to fill them with a material product. That's just the age old tactic of advertising and that social media is no different. The reason why its algorithms are written to create a sense of deficiency and deficit is so that we click on the targeted ad once we've uh, consumed the content. So the social media machine is really just what advertising has been doing for decades, but just blown up to out of all proportion and uh, infected into our lives every single moment of every single day. And when you're bombarded with that sense of everybody else is perfect and I'm not perfect enough, then of course it's going to have a massive impact on young people's perfectionism. Again, you know, this is too, too long of a subject to go into right now, but uh, my book covers it. Um, there's plenty of papers on it. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of a help or a useful resource right now um, for young people. Uh, I can't think of one uh, off the top of my head, but there's loads of good, there's loads of good, uh, Donna Freitas's work. Uh, she wrote a very good book interviewing young people on their experiences in um, in uh, uh, social media. And, and that's a really interesting one if you want to get an insight into how they're how they're navigating those platforms. Um, one of the things we have a question that has to do with how how students can help one another uh, address perfectionism and perfectionistic tendencies. And another question about how schools can, uh, kind of building on that same uh, idea, the community that's around the individual, the student community, how they can help one another, and then how schools can help uh, to address perfectionism. Yeah, again, um, good question. And uh, there's plenty of initiatives um, that uh, schools could look to um, around uh, providing a or creating cultures of peer support and working together um, trying to kind of bust this myth of this kind of zero sum grade into a curve idea that young people seem to you know feel quite strongly uh, so communal work uh, group activities really really important um, bringing uh, students together to work and learn to get, uh, to go on projects, to work collaboratively, you know, all of these kind of activities where, you know, we kind of, in the past, we, we treat students as individual units. So you need to, you know, get the tests and make the sets and all the rest of it to kind of break down that idea and get them working collaboratively um, would be really important at a school level. Um, and, and of course, you know, things like public testing, the public result test, this, like, you know, this idea that, you know, there's a kind of grade. And, and I mean, I saw in the US, I don't know if this is true, but someone was telling me that some some districts, they they it, parents can just go on a website and find their kids grade. Right. Like, I mean, this is crazy how young people can see where they sit like in front of their eyes you know all of that sort of stuff very very instantly you stop that that would that would solve quite a few problems in an instant so this you know i guess what i'm saying is this fixation on competition that we've kind of been acculturated to over the last 20 or so years um has had a cascading effects and if we can just turn the tide on that and and uh, foster collaboration so that you know if one student does well, that doesn't mean it's at the expense of another, right? This kind of this kind of sense that we can all achieve, um, and uh, and I think those sorts of things are um, for me really really important. Yeah, it's interesting because it feels like you're saying that within school communities or even friendship groups, or that the that the norms that get established there can be a buffer against these broader cultural forces that are exacerbating this in general. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a question about, um, it, it's, I think a, a really interesting question. What, um, what do you do when you can see that your spouse and the other parent is highly perfectionistic and that they're struggling with this and that it's having an impact on, uh, on family life and on the, the children? Um, what can that that partner who is not a perfectionist do in a moment like that without making it worse? You know, so any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, again, empathy and don't try and fix things. I think that's most important. I think a lot of a lot of um, you know, I've, uh, I myself have had 
um, over the years, relationships where, where um, they've, they've quite, that it's been difficult because um, the, there's there's a sense it comes from a great place, it comes from a place of love and, and wanting to, you know, uh, not see somebody, you know, really kind of descend into a pit of self-loathing almost, you know, you want to kind of pull them out. But I think the most important thing is to, instead of trying to push back on that and constantly trying to mend and thick things is to just listen and be a sounding board, no judgment, um, complete psychological space to just unload and uh, really, you know, it, allow them to describe and explain a bit like I was talking about with the way that we tried to bring uh, young people around. It isn't about fixing, it's about listening and and really trying trying to do the best with those uh, thoughts and those emotions and and you know working through them drawing them to their logical end point you know it's about kind of it's it's moving with the tide of those emotions to kind of explore them and uh i guess deconstruct them in that way um so for me as i said empathy listening and space to uh to share i think are the most important things um and and I think if you can, you know, if you can create that space, you'll you'll find that perfections do start to open up, um, and they do find that that's a really useful outlet for them, where they can get that kind of tension and and um, cognitive, I guess, uh, ruminative stress out, um, without feeling like they're judged, without feeling like somebody's telling them that they're wrong or they should they shouldn't feel that. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, that that's probably the most important. Yeah, that makes sense, especially because you explained that the first signs are the rumination. So it kind of makes sense that creating a space in the the relationship to hold them would make, it feels like a sensible first step. Um, We have a question. It's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a thorny one and possibly a bigger issue. But when, when you mentioned that 30 to 40% of uh, perfectionists, uh, it, per- perfectionism is heritable, right? So, and that, uh, and, and because of that, likely something you might be able to pick up on in childhood, earlier childhood. Um, we have a question about how you can tell that this is an actual inherited trait um, biologically inherited is a learned behavior growing up in a perfectionistic household um well the two go hand in hand because perfectionistic parents tend to raise perfectionistic children and that's um through multiple pathways one of which is because there's a genetic component but then also because if you genetically supposed to be perfectionist you tend to also um parent in in, in ways that are also conducive to more perfectionism, if you see what I mean. So there's kind of a sim, there's a symbiosis. Um, one of the things I would say is though, we do tend to overstate slightly our uh, um, impact uh, in the sense that we know from behavioral, behavior, uh, sorry, behavioral geneticists that p- genes matter like loads, right? So, you know, if you, Jesse is supposed to be perfectionism, it's likely, you know, if your uh, parents are perfectionists, likely you can also be a perfectionist, right? That's really strong. Mm-hmm. But the socialization aspect is 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 less clear. And whether it comes from parents directly or whether it comes from broader culture outside of the household is is, is something that's of, of an interesting debate. That doesn't mean that there aren't things you can do. And I've, I've tried to discuss some of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it, it, genes are really strong and, and really powerful and, and i think if you if you are a perfectionist it's likely a children will be too so just something to be aware of that's um, that's the only reason i really I, I raise it um because it's you know it's important to be aware that, that there is that impact right yes it, it's really mostly for that um one of the um uh, i know we know that you uh, you had uh, you spoke about procrastination in your presentation but there have been at least five questions about procrastination uh and 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 you gave some if you i know you gave some tips about just getting started um and i think and th- those make sense is there anything beyond that because i think some of the feeling is that well, I try that. I try that. Just give it a try, you know, get started. It'll be easier. You just have a few words on the page, but that's not always helpful. 
Um, when that fails as a strategy, what next? What can a parent do to help their child or what can a parent do to help herself when that happens? Um, you know, is there, do you have anything beyond that just start advice? Yeah, of course. Like, um, the, 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 obviously, like, getting started is, is, is crucial. So, sometimes I find it helps to, because the reason why I procrastinate is because we've got something massive, right? We don't know if it's easy, we don't procrastinate. Like, we know we can do that, an email, whatever. Like, you don't, and well, I mean, emails are interesting ones because if you, there are also times where you procrastinate because you're worried about what's inside the email. So, you know, but if it's a straightforward task, we apply with it so it's only it's just the first thing to say it's only on, on really challenging tough so what so what i tend to do because i struggle with this too is get started but if i'm really struggling to even get started i'll just do something different that's related to the task that i've got to do so for instance i'll um i'll write a letter to my mum if i've got to write like a you know a start a research paper I, nothing to do with the task but what it does do is it gets my mind in a, in a in a writing mode so I'm putting things on the paper, I'm writing sentences, I'm paying attention to form and structure, and I'm creating something. And I find then once I've done that, it's easier for me to pivot into the task that I've got to do. And as long as, you know, as long as that, the you know, as long as the reason that I'm doing that activity is so that I know when I'm finished, I'm going to move into the, the actual project activity. I find that helps me make the transition and and get started so that's something that i found useful and something i also recommend um, to my students uh, you've also got to remember uh, procrastination is an anxiety management problem so it's not a time management problem so that's also crucial so dealing with those primary anxieties is also something we should pay attention to and i think for me i you know the way i explain to my my young students is look you know you're using procrastination really as, as a way to survive that kind of emotional damage of the failure you think that you're going to inflict in some imagined future. But all you're doing is being damaged simply by the passage of time. So if you think about it, then it's an, it, you know, procrastination is, is a completely illogical way to manage anxiety. And if, again, if you can just accept that, acknowledge that, let that go in and actually understand that, and then that's also, I found that some, you know, sometimes there's been a bit of a turning point as well for some of the students that I mentor. They've been able to, you know, make that flip around how, it, it, you know, even the procrastination itself uh, creates more, creates problems. So, the, the, you know, the solution is, isn't one, um, isn't, isn't sustainable. So, so for me, those are the things I found useful. But again, you know, it's really tough. It isn't, it isn't easy. It isn't easy. Um, and it takes a lot of practice, a lot of patient practice. Um, and even, you know, people like me who study it for a living still struggle with it. So, you know, there are some things we can do, but, it, you know, there's a lot of empathy from me that it is. Deep. Yes. Um, I like that idea, though, of kind of like tricking yourself into whatever the doing is, like just do an adjacent thing that requires the same basic task and then uh, at least that feels like it's it feels like a very practical thing to try yeah um yeah um we've uh there's quite uh, several people have mentioned that we talk a lot about trying to cultivate a growth mindset in our children um you know something that enables them to look upon mistakes as opportunities for growth and not to frame them as anything that's uh, that's a failure or um, or that says something about who they are and their worthiness. Like that's one thing we talk about a lot in our schools. Um, and despite that, all this talk about a growth mindset, we're here to hearing we're hearing about this rising perfection perfectionism epidemic. Um, can can you talk a little bit about like what how are these things related to one another? Is it that we aren't talking enough about a growth mindset? Is it the way we're going about it, or is talking about a growth mindset not sufficient to prevent perfectionism? Anything around that would be helpful. Okay, here's the thing. 
this is in this is a really in something I've thought so long and deeply about, and um, uh, it makes a it's a major part of the end of my book. So growth mindset is really interesting because on the surface, it sounds really uh, adaptive. It sounds like something that would be a really interesting antidote to perfectionism. But there's two things I'd say about the growth mindset that have troubled me. The first is the, the term mindset. So I don't want my mind to be set on anything. Never remind me if it's healthy or what. I want there to be psychological flexibility in the way that I approach things uh, in life. Sometimes I'll regress. Sometimes I'll get better. Sometimes I'll stand still. And all of those things are quite acceptable human conditions and things that we shouldn't be afraid of. So that's the first thing. But the second thing, and more importantly about growth, in and of itself is really interesting because growth purports to celebrate failure, but actually it does the opposite. And it does the opposite in this way. Think about it like this. When we focus on growth, what we're doing when we fail is we say, okay, I've got to turn that failure into something else. I can't just let it sit. I've got to recycle it into growth. I've got to rehabilitate it on the redemptive arc of growth. Okay, so that no trace of that failure is left lingering as a reminder. And that for me gets to the essence of the problem with this fixation on growth at all costs. Because if all we're doing when we're when we're saying, well, we need to have a growth mindset, we've got to, you know, take this failure and stick a lapel on it that says growth and send it out into the world as something different. What we're doing is we're we're not dealing with the failure itself and we're not accepting that that failure, that that setback is a humanizing reminder. It's a reminder what it means to be human. Don't try to instantly dismiss it or recycle it. Just let it sit there for a minute. Allow it in. Allow that feeling of fallibility to wash through you. Because in that moment, that's when you really recognize what it means to be hum a human being. And if we try to dismiss it and try to continue to take it into another direction and move it forward, then what we're doing is we're not allowing ourselves any psychological space to do the other things that are so, so important. And you know, part of being human, like I said, moving forward, yeah, great, we're gonna move forward, that's fantastic, but we're also gonna regress and we're also gonna stand still. And all of those things are completely acceptable um, and we should allow psychological space for them because that's what being human means. And I think sometimes in modern society, uh, focus on growth, fixation on doing better, men getting bigger, faster, whatever, all of it, all, all of it kind of makes the acceptance that we're just human almost impossible. And I think uh, for, for me, that acceptance of just being a human being uh, and, and that we are flawed and that we are imperfect, and that's what's beautiful about us, is such an important thing to carry through life. Um, and so for me, growth doesn't allow us to do that. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's potentially problematic. However, what I would say is that doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, focus on growth over and above things like metrics, grades, and all the rest of it and outcomes. I think there's there's a place for it, but I don't think it should be the be all and end all of the way that we approach uh, achievement. Uh, if that makes sense. That makes great sense. And I think it is a really beautiful way to wrap up our conversation tonight. So um, I would just say on behalf of the solid board and all of our solid member schools, thank you so much, Thomas, for this conversation tonight. I think uh, it's a topic that a lot of us think about a lot, deal with in our lives. Um, but don't get the chance to reflect on in the way that you just allowed us to. So, so thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I um, just want to remind everybody that if you want to learn more, Thomas's book, The Perfection Trap, is available for pre-order. It's on Amazon, and we will have a recording of this session up on the Sala website in a few days. So please do check back if you um, want to hear anything again, or if uh, someone in your life might want to, uh, to see it. And with that, I will wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you for being here. Um, farewell. <laughs>